Well, hello, beautiful teachers, and welcome to day two of the seven days for seven ways to gamify series to celebrate the first birthday of the Vibrant Music Teaching Membership site. I'm so excited to have you guys here every day this week until the 18th, which is the VMT's birthday. I'm going to be sharing free trainings right here on the Colourful Keys page, different times every day to suit different time zones, and also giving away free prizes leading up to the annual VMT membership, which I'm giving away on the last day, on the 18th, the actual birthday. So it's great to see some comments pouring in already from members and... Um, who are joining us live, and I'm excited to kick off this training. First, just a little bit about how this is going to work. For those of you who didn't join me for day one yesterday, um, you can sign up right now at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash birthday. That's how you get the email updates every time I go live. The reason you want to do that instead of relying on Facebook to tell you when I go live is because Facebook doesn't do that very consistently. Even when you subscribe, it's a great idea to get noti click that get notified button and it should let you know, but email is way more reliable. So sign up there, that way you get on live um, or quickly as soon as you can afterwards. The reason you want to do that is you need to comment quickly to be in with a shot of winning one of my goodies here. I've got these fun colourful presents different colours on each one, and then the annual membership. So every day from now until the 18th, I'll be giving away one of these six gifts. And if you enter to win one of the six gifts as we go along, you're also in the drawing for the annual VMT membership. So even more reason to do it. So the way you're going to enter today's post, I'm going to be announcing the winner from yesterday today, and you can get in the drawing for the next prize, which is tomorrow, and also for the annual VMT membership. So, not that one. You want to answer this question, and you want to do it in this format. So, same format every day, guys. You're going to do VMT, the colour of the gift that you want me to open for you. And if it's already gone, I'll pick one for you. If you don't put a colour, I'll also pick one for you. But it's more fun if you pick, okay? So, VMT, colour, so VMT blue, for example. And then the answer to the question, the question of the day, I'm pointing the wrong direction, is there. <laughs> Have you used practice games before? There's no right or wrong answer. You can just say, no, nope, never. You can say, yes, and tell me your favorite. So this is my example. VMT Blue, this, is, this one is my favorite. Like, explain the actual practice game. Or it could just be VMT, no, but I love the idea of it that kind of thing. So I hope that's clear. Answer the question and put VMT at the start or you won't be entered into the drawing. Just checking in with the comments here. Uh, Elizabeth is joining. Hey Elizabeth, Catherine, Claire, Ket, Jennifer, Jimmy. Great to see so many members here. And the first comment coming in, so just to give you guys an example of how this works. Christy said VMT blue. My kids loved your practice bingo. So that's the game she used was the practice bingo, which is one of mine. So that's awesome. Okay, I'm going to be announcing the winner from yesterday at the end of today's broadcast. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, I want to give you some awesome practice tips to help you gamify your students' practice. And the first thing we need to talk about is routine. Might not sound very gamified, and it's really not. And there isn't a way to gamify routine. You can incentivize it, but you can't really gamify routine. If you can, let me know how you're going to do it. But I don't think there's really a way to make it a game. But you can make it pretty pleasurable for the student and the parent if it starts at the very start. So I'm big on getting students going with a routine from the start and making that your sole focus for at least the first semester. You do not worry about them practicing effectively, using good strategies, practicing the right things even, practicing all the things, doesn't matter to me at all. First semester, all I want is that they practice consistently at least five days a week. Could be for one minute, could be for 20, I don't care. I only care that they got to the piano consistently. And when I do this with my very beginning students, with the ones who are just starting out, they don't have a problem. They don't fight with mum or dad. 
Even down the track, I found they don't. So when it's really, really established and it's just what they do, they just practice every day, that's just part of what they do, like brushing your teeth, as we say, then they don't have a problem in the long term. So once that routine is established, that's when we start to talk about practice strategies. And this we can gamify. But in the beginning, establishing that practice routine and keeping it up as you go forward, you can do fun things like this. Ooh, that's hard to see. There he is. You can kind of see him. What's down the bottom of my assignment sheet? There is, and this is a real assignment sheet that I'm using tomorrow with my student, is a bunch of Mozarts. So there's all these little Mozarts down the bottom and they color in one for each day. You could just add spaces for stickers. You could have something else they color in. Sarah from Sarah's Music Studio, Sarah Campbell, she has some great color in assignment sheets as well. That's one way to sort of incentivize the daily practice and make it a little bit fun, and I love that. Adding some color to assignment sheets is great. And the added bonus there is they have to look at the assignment sheet at least a little bit to be able to color it in. So it helps establish that they're reading through what you want them to practice as well. So that's great for new students and continuing through all kids basically wouldn't do that with teens unless they're particularly into it. Um, genuine, generally, I'd do that with younger students, say under 12s. So moving forward from there, we get to get into the fun stuff, the strategies and the gamified techniques. And I have a few to share with you today. Um, three simple practice games, actually. And they're taken from the Practice Pro course and other resources inside VMT. So, the first one is called Crossing the River. So VMT members who've already taken the Practice Pro course and are using the Practice Doctor will be familiar with this. This involves three little guys. These guys. You can't just about see them. They're Oako erasers, which are very popular with piano teachers the world over at this stage. This is what they look like if you haven't seen them before. And the great thing about them the reason they're so popular is that they fit on the keys. Now, don't have to be hedgehogs, don't have to be your wacko erasers, could be anything, but you need three things. And the three things, in fact, in the practice kit, I just use dice, three dice. So they sit over one side of the music stand. I put them on the left and three of them over there. The next step is a student plays their chosen piece or section of their piece. Most likely a section. So whenever, this game is great because actually whenever they can't complete it, and I'm gonna show you what completing it means or explain to you what completing it means, but when they can't, it makes it very apparent to them that they're tackling something that's too big. So that's one of the big benefits of this. But what they do is they have three things on the left and they play their chosen piece or section if they play it correctly, they move one of the things, in my case hedgehogs, across the river to the other side of the music stand. Okay? They play it again. If they play it correctly, they move another one across to the other side. If they play it incorrectly, though, he goes back across the river. Make sense? So, what this effectively is, is three in a row correct plays. That's all, all it actually means, is that they have to play it three times in a row correctly to get them over the other side. But having a tactile thing that they move side to side, making it into a game like this is so valuable and so much more likely that they're going to follow through on it at home, i found. If you have a physical thing that you're moving and a way to demonstrate what it is you're doing, you're going to actually play it three times in a row correctly. You're not going to just say you did in your own head and lie to yourself a little bit. And I'm sure we've all done that too, right? Lie to yourself about how you're practicing and how good the quality is. Uh, so let me know if you've done that to yourself or if you know students who have done that. But having a physical thing to move across does make a huge difference here. Now, a little note about what correctly means. Anything. Anything you define or the student defines for themselves. It could be that correctly means counting accurately the whole time. And it doesn't even matter if they play the wrong note. It could mean that they get all the correct notes and rhythms. It could mean that they fix one specific problem that's been happening again and again. 
and even if they make another mistake, as long as they get that bit right, it's that pernicious a problem that as long as they get that bit right, it's okay they've achieved what you want them to achieve. So whatever correctly is for your student, they need to do it three times in a row um, to get them across the river. And Gemma just said, I love crossing the river with kids instead of saying, do it again, over and over. Yeah, and I love it too because my piano teacher used to say, um, my best and last piano teacher in uh, when I was growing up used to say, Okay, do that eight more times. But she never said it had to be right. And she did mean that it had to be right eight more times or by the end. And I always fail, felt like I was just failing because then I would get to the end of the eight times and she would say, okay, again, again, again. And I felt so much pressure. Whereas having these little hedgehogs, it's a cute little game. Everyone laughs when they go back across the river. No one is ever bothered by it in my experience. And it's so great for morale <laughs> as we work through these tricky parts. And as I said, if they can't get the hedgehogs across the river, their section is too big or they're going too fast or they should try it hand separately. These are the three Graham Fitch S's, which are sections, Slowly, separately, and I put them in that order. That's how you should do it. Make the section smaller until you can't anymore. Go slower until you can't go any slower. And then do hands separately. Hands separately is kind of a last resort for me. So, se section slowly, separately. Those are my three S's. They're Graham Fitch's originally, but those are what I use in my studio as well. So getting the hedgehogs across the river helps students to focus on correctly playing it. So quality renditions, and it gives them incentive to actually reflect between the hedgehogs too, between the attempts, because if they get it wrong, he's going to go back over. So they don't have that thing where they just play it and play it and play it and play it and they're just playing F natural instead of F sharp again and again and again and practicing their mistake into their fingers, which is counterproductive. That's great for that. And it also helps them to identify for themselves when they're taking on too much, because most of the time they are from my experience. Uh, Jimmy just wrote a great comment there. She said, I love that they get some ownership over their repetitions. Also makes them listen to themselves. Awesome, Jimmy. Yes, I agree so much. Um, and Alison said, I use the three threes with all my students. So, awesome comments coming in. Keep them coming in as you think about these things. I'm gonna go on to the next practice strategy here. So that was crossing the river. The next one is Dice Game. Least imaginative name? Well, the next one isn't that imaginative either. <laughs> the Dice Game comes from my practice kit. And it's all over the internet, so it's not my idea. But what they do here is they're going to take something, a piece of paper, a whiteboard, or whatever. What I have to do today is the back of a blackboard, which actually has a staff on it, so I'm not using the front. The back of it. And we divide it into two. Ta-da! And then they're going to roll the dice. Okay, so say I get, what did I get there? Three. Okay, that's three points up for grabs. Now they're going to again play their piece or the section of the piece that they've chosen to work on. Always making that distinction that it could be two bars. And if they play it correctly, again, defining correctly as you see fit, they're going to add on, let's call this me and up for opponent, okay? So, if they play it incorrectly, those three go here. If they play it correctly, the three goes here. And they're continuing up to a number that you decide. I like to do um, 30, I think, usually, but it'll depend on the student and the goals you have for them. You know, a beginner it might be 10, that's fine. If they get a six and a four, they've only played it twice, and that's okay. Um, but having, again, that incentive that the opponent is going to keep getting points and they're the winner if they get to 31st, then it just gives them that battle. And obviously, there is no opponent. The opponent is their own confidence in their playing and their own ability to slow it down, split it up into sections and do it separately if they need to and work out the problems and reflect. So... That's a great one. Again, that's from the practice kit. So you can go to colorfulkeys.ie slash practice dash kit or just 
search for that in Google and you'll come up with that. VM team members can, of course, find it inside the library. That is the dice game. Let me know if you, what you think of that one and whether you get what I'm saying and how the process works. If you have any follow up questions, I'm happy to answer those live here. Um, the third game I've got for you is Edge Backwards. Like I said, not very imaginative either. But here's how Edge Backwards work. I'm going to take one of my favourite duet books to use as an example here. And let's take this page, okay? This is Three Point Play, Primo Part. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to mark it with little stickies. Okay? I just call those stickies. You can call them tabs or highlighter tabs or whatever. I'm going to take two of those. Let's say... What would be the trickiest part of this? It's not a difficult piece, but for a beginner, they might find it difficult where the left hand comes in here. So let's put it there. Let's say that's the tricky bit. Mm, up to there, okay? So I've marked that now. That's my tricky bit. And they're going to play that until they can play it successfully. Then they're going to edge backwards. So you're going to take that yellow tab and move it one note, not one beat, one note back. Like that. So now they're starting and they're playing from here, like so. And then when they can do that, they edge back to the C. Da, 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 da. That's my common sound effect, by the way, as I point to what we're going to play. I do that with repeats a lot. Do you do that? Da, 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 da. I don't know why. Anyway, then we're starting from the B here. We're going through. Then we're moving it back again and again. I like to say that they need to continue going backwards until... The section before it is at least as big as the section. So that was a two bar section. They need to go back until it's at least two bars before. Normally that'll be about the size one or two bars, right? So that's not a big ask. Edging backwards like that gives them more context. I was going to say confidence, but context too. Confidence in playing that section that they were finding difficult. It makes it into a gimme instead of the tricky part. And it gives them context because they're moving back away from it so they don't stumble with now the joining between the two. And again, it's just a way to physicalize, that's not a word, the actual process of edging away from something or of incorporating something into a larger piece. We might be able to do that ourselves just by just by instinct or just by thinking through it but having tabs to move makes a huge difference for young students and for beginners of all ages you know the crossing the river thing I used that recently with an adult student and to tell you the di the difference it made I can't even express it that week it was astounding how much more confident and happy she was with her playing the following week how much less backtracking she did checking you know going back and going, oh, and sorry, and, you know, she was so much more confident, made a massive difference. So don't reserve these types of practice games for kids. They're not just for kids. They don't need to be. They really can be for everyone. By the way, if you're just joining us now, I want to give you some notices. So you can answer the question of the day to be in with the shot of winning one of our prizes here and winning the annual VMT membership on the final day. Our question of the day is, have you used practice games before? And if so, what are they? And this is the format you want to answer in. We've got VMT, colour, and then answer. Let's take Catherine as an example here. Catherine said, VMT, blue, yes. Take a rest. This game has helped my students in school get a grasp on note values. Awesome. Yeah, that's a game from VMT. So uh, great that that's making a difference in Catherine's studio. Okay, so those are three practice games and all of those are focused on taking the time to play correctly, which is one of the biggest things and it sounds so silly, but it's actually not. Students do not take the time to reflect so that they can actually fix the mistake. They just bash away at stuff. That's what I used to do. Is that what you used to do? That's what I did for most of my piano studies, bashing and bashing and bashing until it worked out. And yes, I got there, but it wasn't very good for, well, anything. It was a bit of a waste of time. I wasted a lot of time doing that, I'm sure. Don't think it was particularly good for my technique, because you get frustrated and then you just bash harder, which isn't very good for you. And yeah, it's just not a good strategy and it's not very musical. So to avoid the bashing away, these three practice games are great, as are other ones which are in the VMT library. 
The next thing I want to show you is um, a tactic for making practice more interesting. The other biggest pitfall in practice is it's similar, but it's basically students lo losing interest midway. And this is especially pernicious if you have a practice time requirement. So I'd like to discourage those unless you're that attached to it in your studio. Telling students to practice for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever might sound good. And it's good to sometimes to give as a guideline when parents are wondering like, but they're really not practicing much and they think they're done. But focusing on the results is much better and keeping them engaged during their practice time is much more important. So that's where a game like this comes in. This is Practice Hero. You can see that quite well, actually. It shows up well. So the way Practice Hero works is it's a board game and they're going to move along it. I've detailed in the VMT several ways to use this, so I won't go into all of them now. But let's say, for example, you have them set this up on top of their piano, put a counter on, you know, one of your little hedgehogs or something else, and roll the dice every day to move forward. And then they just do the thing that's on that square. You can also do it without a die, and they have to do everything on the board then. And some examples of stuff, I took suggestions for these, so some of them are based on member suggestions. Let's see here. Got play with a metronome or a drumbeat. Okay. Play as quietly as you can. Tap it out with your fingertips. By that I mean on a hard surface, like three, one, three, two, one, whatever. Um, play as quickly as you can. Hum the piece without looking in your book. Play and say the intervals e.g. skip up, third up, etc. Play the trickiest bar measure 13 times. So just the fact that it's 13 kind of makes it more fun, <laughs> even though that's way more than 5. 5 is a boring number. 13 is way more interesting. Okay, so it has all these different things. And strategies like that are great for when students are just falling asleep during their practice. I mean, they're just going through their motions and it's not really achieving anything all that awesome because they're just doing whatever. And playing the piece from start to finish and doing whatever is, you know, it's a waste of their time and their parents' time in getting them to the bench in the first place and all of that stuff. And you don't want to have that routine, that fantastic routine in place and not be using it to its best effect as things move forward, as I say, past the first semester. Okay, so that's Practice Hero, and that, or Playful Practice, Pensive Practice, those cards, stuff like that, where they have a random task to do that is musical and relevant probably to their piece, but is kind of unpredictable what they're going to be doing, and it keeps it fun and light and interesting. Most important part being it's interesting. So that is a great way to work on that. And then the last resource I want to show you today is this guy. The MT members might have seen this. This is part of the Practice Pro course. And actually, interesting, I hope, story. This guy is called the Practice Doctor. And I originally actually invented this. Oh, how long ago is that now? Two years, I think, for a workshop I was doing with three students who were tweens, like 10, 9 or 10, I think, at the time. I had three girls coming for this workshop and it was going to be about practice and I decided to base it all on a doctor theme. Okay, so I had a paper stethoscope, couldn't get an actual stethoscope last minute, even though one of my brothers is a doctor, but anyway, and a clipboard with this on it and they had to assess what each other was doing, what ailment was happening in their practice and um, suggest a good practice strategy to combat that. So this was a simplified version of what now exists as part of the Practice Pro course in the VMT. And what we did was work through it during the group lesson. And the reason I say it's an interesting story is because if any of you know my book, The Piano Practice Physician's Handbook, this is the genesis of that idea. After that, a few months after that, I started writing the book and expanding upon this. But this is still a great simplified way to approach this for students to understand it. The book is aimed at teachers and it's so in depth and you know all these different strategies and all this stuff and that's I hope great for you guys but not for students they can't read that and put it into practice they need something much more simplified so that's where practice doctor comes in so this is how it looks and we've got the symptom over here stopping and starting and I'm calling that a cough and then the solution is crossing the river which we talked about today so some of the other ones here we've got inconsistent rhythm is the sniffles 
and they're going to do rhythm repeats for that. Specific sticky bits, some bits are tough, but everything else is okay. That's going to be aches and pains, edge backwards, which we talked about today as well. Too fast or rushed sounding is a fever. How many of you have students with a fever all the time in their playing? And that's going to be tempo trials with that. And too slowly, very common with adult students, I find, is chills, and that's going to be the metronome ladder. And then missing articulations or dynamics is drowsy. And that's going to be expression exaggeration. So what I have in the Practice Pro course, in the Practice Doctor, is these guys. These are the prescriptions. So there's six prescriptions. Kept it simple. Six is manageable. And they, the six symptoms. And that's an amazing start, actually, for a young student up to quite a few years into their study. If they can even just pinpoint which of those six things is happening and do something appropriate for that, they're going to be way more targeted than most students and then probably than any of us, certainly me, certainly I was during my beginning years of study. So they get to understand those symptoms over a period of weeks. And the very important part is that you do the prescriptions multiple times in the lesson so that they're super confident with the crossing the river strategy that they will in implement it at home then. They won't do it if you haven't done it in the lesson. Pretty much guarantee you. I mean, some will. Let's say 5% maybe. But most students will not do it at home. Unless you do it in the lesson. And probably several times. Don't think about it as wasted time. It's fantastic quality practice. That's not a bad use of lesson time. Don't worry about it. And it's going to improve their practice all week. So I think it's a great use of your lesson time. Uh, Catherine said, I love the movable stickers. I have only used a folded, folded piece of A4 paper I had to move along, but highlighting a small area and then moving it back makes much more sense and really highlights the area better. Glad that idea was useful for you, Catherine. I hope you enjoy using it. I l use sticky tabs for so much stuff. I stick them on the keys as well. I've checked that the particular brands I buy don't leave any residue on my keys. Um, and all that stuff. Yeah, they're fantastic. And for just marking assignments and stuff as well. So that's the Practice Doctor, Practice Hero, three practice games. I hope all of those will be useful. Now, the moment we've all been waiting for. I was thinking I should bring a drum out here, and I didn't. To do a drum roll for the winner. I should explain my thinking a little bit clearer. So, I didn't bring out a drum, but you can imagine the drum roll. And you may have noticed, if you joined me yesterday... That someone new is on the scene. This is my little coconut. And normally what lives inside him are the silliness siestas, which are little cards that we use as brain breaks, especially for preschool lessons. But today he has been borrowed for the purpose of drawing the first winner from. So I'm going to draw out one of these. In fact, I'll give it a shake first, just to be fair. I'm going to draw out one of these. These are all comments from yesterday. Which means that yesterday's post you now can't win from, but you can win from today. So let's just review that before I do this. You can answer this question. Have you used practice games in the format VMT? Which color you want to win? And then your answer to be in with a chance of winning tomorrow. And you'll still win even if you're not live. But if I can't track you down, I'll of course uh, choose a replacement person. So... Amy, yes, your comments are coming through. You see nothing on Facebook live page, and I see no one else's comments. Amy, that is super weird, but I can assure you that I'm seeing them, and Facebook is a weirdo. That's all I can say about that. It is it is a weird dude. It does odd things. You may need to change up. Um, so just under the actual video, on the left, there should be a thing that says, like, real-time comments or... Oh no, maybe that's only on the replay. Anyway, either way, I can see them, Amy, and they'll probably appear later for you too. So, I'm going to draw the winner. Are we ready? Excited. First winner. And I'm going to open the gift, by the way, so that's a super fun part, so you'll see what's inside. So, my coconut says... Star Manili. Fantastic. VMT Blue. So, she wants the blue prize, so that's what we're opening today. Super excited. 
remembering the landmark notes. It was her comment yesterday about the problems with note reading. So that's our winner for today is Star. I don't think I've seen her live. If she is here, please chime in, Star. But we're going to open the present for her and then, of course, I'm going to rewrap it before I send it. But we need to know what it is, right? I mean, come on. So, this is the blue gift which Star has asked for. And I'm just going to open this up here. Oh, so excited. So, let's see what's inside. Obviously, I know what's inside. I'm going to show you guys. Uh, here we go. Lots of rustling. Ta-da! Okay, these are my posters, which I actually have a copy of on my wall in my studio. So if you've ever watched a teaching video or, um, in VMT or one of the public YouTube quick clip videos, you might have noticed these posters I have on my wall. I have them up in frames and each one is a different composer. So this is the Debussy one and each one has a quote on them. So we've got Debussy, we've got a token woman, of course. I love her quote too. Why hurry over beautiful things? Why not linger and enjoy them? Um, and we've got this dude and this dude. There's only six, so, you know, one token woman was all I could fit in with having Mozart and everyone. It's a mistake to think that practice of my art has become easy to me, very relevant to today's session. So, Star, I'm really excited to send those over to you. I hope that you love them. And, of course, you, um, everyone who entered today will go back in the drawing at the last day, the 18th, the actual VMT birthday. And on that day, I'll be drawing for the last gift and then the annual VMT membership. So... All the presents are different types of things, so don't think that they're all going to be posters now. They're all different exciting things, and you definitely want to tune in tomorrow to get another chance to win one. And of course, I'll be answer, uh, announcing the winner from today then too. Thank you so much to all of you for joining me. It's been a great session. I hope you've enjoyed it, and it's been great to see all your comments coming through about... <laughs> about uh, the different things. I was just laughing at Catherine because she said, blue just got chosen, so now can I choose green? I'm going to randomize it. If you've, if someone has chosen blue and I draw them tomorrow, I'm going to pick because I can't keep track if everyone says a different colour they want. So that's the way it's going to be. I'll pick at random or I'll let people vote live. That'd be more fun. Let's do that. So if it's a blue tomorrow, I will let you guys choose who it actually is. The next session is on tomorrow. If you haven't signed up already for the email updates to make sure you can join me live or as soon after as possible to be in with a shot of winning, you're going to want to sign up at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash birthday. That means you'll also get the page with all the replay with links in one spot, which is really handy. So definitely sign up there if you haven't already. And thank you you all so much again for joining me it's been fantastic to chat with all of you and i'll be winding that winging its way that will be winging its way rather to star very shortly bye for now guys